Before I get started, I just want to underscore how important and enthusiastic I am about the science presentation that we just heard. Um, if we can move from a paradigm in which science missions cost uh, not a billion dollars or maybe even ten billion dollars, which many NASA uh, um, flagships are, to a time when NASA science missions can cost a million or a hundred thousand or even ten thousand dollars, Imagine the number of craft that can be out there exploring the solar system. To me, that is just such an exciting vision, and you and uh, Dr. Zerbikin and everyone is just doing such a great job at NASA putting uh, an idea, which has been out there for a while, into real uh, policy and funding and practice. And I think uh, the science results that you're going to get over the coming years and decades are going to be tremendously important. So well done, well done to you. Um, so uh, today what I wanted to do was to just give an update on uh, the company um, and then to talk a little bit about the big picture and how we move uh, in terms of orders of magnitude from uh, a few people flying into space to uh, many people flying into space. What are the uh, crucial things, the transformative things that are going to make that happen for real? Um, and uh, as, as we go through that, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of, uh, of reusability, and, uh, and I'll talk more about that when we get there. So uh, to start off, let me just give a quick introduction to where we stand in the test flight program, and I'll, I'll talk you through a few things. Um, uh, so the White Knight uh, program, the, the White Knight is our carrier aircraft, and that's flown now over 250 times and is uh, essentially through its test flight uh, program. It just serves as the carrier aircraft for the spaceship. Um, uh, the uh, spaceship Unity has now completed 14 uh, test flights, um, of which the final three have been powered flights, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, that. I thought it'd be interesting for folks to see just the basic trajectory of one of these flights, and I'm actually not sure which one this is. It's either the second or the third one, um, but just to give people a sense of what does the vehicle do during one of these uh, during one of these flights. And so what you see is on the far right of uh, the image for you, um, the moment of um, separation from the carrier aircraft. Uh, and what's interesting is that the, the vehicle actually doesn't um, drop down. If you look at our videos, sometimes you'll get the sense that the spaceship is dropping down. But what's actually really happening is that the carrier aircraft is sort of shooting up um, because the uh, carrier aircraft has just lost about half of its mass. And so what you see in separation is that the carrier aircraft sort of goes up like that. The spaceship goes down a little bit. But you see that separation. And then the, uh, and then the spaceship uh, ignites its rocket motor, um, makes a gamma turn, uh, mostly vertical. And you can see what's interesting about this chart, I think, um, and uh, true for any space flight system, is uh, how much oomph you get for a given amount of rocket uh, impulse. So you'll see you know, that the rocket burnout is uh, just a bit up the curve. It doesn't even look like it's um, you know, halfway up. Uh, and then that whole um, period after the burn, after burnout, is essentially coasting through um, you know, one big parabolic trajectory. And, um, and what's interesting about that, of course, is that after burnout, then that's the, that's the weightless period until you encounter the upper part of the atmosphere again. And so you can see with our system, then, uh, the feather is retracted as you get back down into the atmosphere, a bit higher than um, uh, for the feather for the rocket start, and then you be, you get into a glide flight um, trajectory from there, and you can see we basically uh, glide down into uh, over the over the uh, airport, which we call the high key position, and then uh, we'll do a series of uh, turns to get back down to the airport. So that is what will happen uh, down here in, in New Mexico. You will see um, a takeoff from Spaceport America. We'll then uh, do essentially a sort of a big figure eight as the um, carrier aircraft goes up to the launch altitude. And that actually takes uh, you know, between 45 minutes and an hour. And then uh, we'll have the release you know, n near um, Spaceport America go up through the controlled airspace and down. And that will be what we're, what we're doing down here. And we're tremendously excited to, uh, to do that. Uh, so uh, we have now had a few supersonic flights. This is one of them, the second supersonic flight. Um, 
uh, uh, was in May, end of May. Third supersonic flight um, was in July, um, and uh, and uh, you know you'll see uh, at least one more flight uh, before the end of the year, um, which uh, which is exciting. You know we're getting into uh, a phase of flight where we're going higher, uh, we're approaching longer duration uh, burns, and and that's obviously an exciting uh, milestone for the team. Um, so we'll 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 see. Um, you know, exciting things as we go through the next phase of the test flight program. I think here is maybe a good time to show a quick video just to, you know, we're all in our post-lunch um, tryptophan coma, so um, why don't we uh, show that if that's okay. Yeah, so that was uh, Dave Mackay and uh, Michael Masucci, two of our pilots. Uh, terrific, terrific guys. Um, Such actually uh, landed that. So Dave Mackay is our chief test pilot. Uh, he flew the ascent and the boost phase of that. And then uh, Such, uh, that was his first uh, landing um, after a rocket-powered flight. He'd, he'd flown other um, glide flights before. So that was a, a great milestone. And um, yeah, as I say, more to, more to come. Um, Okay, so just a couple other things. So the next two spaceships um, are now in manufacture in, uh, in our factory. Uh, you can see the cabins of the front. Uh, this is a little bit uh, out of date now. We've attached the nose and, and uh, finished the wing box and of the first one. So that's an exciting thing um, with the vision of building out a fleet of spaceships over time. That will take uh, you know, uh, some time to do, but um, you know, we're really looking forward to getting uh, the next uh, vehicle into service um, uh, when it's ready to uh, start test flight. A um, couple other points that I want to start before I get into uh, philosophizing. Uh, so we have spaceport update. Uh, the, as, as I'm sure you all know, the paving of the southern road has been uh, completed, and, and both northern uh, and southern routes to the Spaceport America are now paved with the opening ceremony uh, soon. And the uh, state of New Mexico has funded a uh, fuel farm um, to serve the spaceport. And then also we've got a new telemetry and communication site to support our operations, which is getting near completion, uh, which includes a gas pad and 
uh, various propellants um, and pressurants, which, which is under construction. So there's a lot of activity out at the spaceport. It'll be particularly active between now uh, through the end of the year as we work on various fit-out activities. Uh, we're really grateful uh, to the, the members of the community, the industrial members of the community who are helping us to build uh, those facilities. Uh, we have great partnerships within the city. And of course, we're super grateful uh, to our partnership with uh, the New Mexico Spaceport Authority and uh, Dan Hicks, uh, its CEO. Um, we have really uh, great working relationships now with, uh, with NMSA. They're doing a terrific job. And I think that um, uh, Dan has really positioned Spaceport America for growth um, and uh, has done a terrific job already of bringing um, both uh, uh, you know, new, new tenants um, on board, new customers on board, as well as doing a terrific job in terms of educational outreach for the New Mexico community and, and really the United States. I'm sure that uh, you've heard a lot about the Spaceport uh, Cup, but um, for those of you who have not gone, you really should uh, sponsor that thing. I, I, uh, for those of you who control your sponsorship budgets, uh, the Spaceport America Cup is probably uh, the most inspiring space education thing that I've been a part of for years. You can imagine you know, over 100 teams coming out to the spaceport with their rockets that they've been working on for a year and then launching those, those puppies up. Um, you know, uh, literally over 1,000 students, uh, college students, these are the cream of the crop. These are the folks that you as other corporations want to, uh, want to recruit. They are definitely the folks that we want to recruit. It is an amazing thing. Sorry for the side note, but I just I, I can't stop uh, talking about the Spaceport uh, Cup. It's really a fantastic thing that, uh, that Dan and his wisdom has, has built up. OK, um, so uh, sort of the, the fonts are a little bit screwy on this thing. But anyway, here's the thing that I wanted to talk to you about today. Um, what is the key to opening space? for all the engineers out there. I think it's cycle life. And you know, we have some folks who are engineers, some folks who are business people. We talk a lot about reusability, but what, what are we really talking about here? We're talking about, I think, the number of times that you can use your vehicle uh, or reuse your vehicle, right? And so uh, you, you know, a brand new Virgin Atlantic 787 can uh, have tens of thousands of cycles, and you know, I actually don't even know what the exact number is for the 747. It used to be 45,000, 737. I think it's up to 75,000 in certain use cases uh, for short hauls. But you're talking about tens of thousands of cycles. So where are we now in the space business? Um, and I mean that communally, not not us, but you know, communally, we're at one to single digits of cycles. And of course, why does that matter? It's because these two vehicles. I mean, I chose a, a cartoon because I just wanted to be generic. Um, these two vehicles both cost, you know, 100 to 300 million dollars each, order of magnitude. You know, I mean, I don't know, 50 million to 250 million. You choose your numbers. You know, we're talking about some suborbitals to all the way up to the Delta IV Heavy or whatever. You know, but you're talking about something with that number of digits in your cost. And when you're dividing that number of digits by one or two or three, you're still going to get a very big number. And so the key to reducing um, uh, the cost is, is reusability, obviously, but uh, more specifically, it is large numbers of reusability. And I wanted to just spend a little bit of time in the time that I have left talking about our approach to that, because our goal really is to get up to um, thousands of cycles on our airframes. Now, I don't know if with Spaceship Two, or at least the initial configuration of Spaceship Two, whether we could reach tens of thousands of cycles. That's a very high bar. But um, we are shooting explicitly in our design requirements for thousands of cycles. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how we're approaching that, because I think that um, that is truly the key. If we talk about um, expanding the space frontier and we talk about um, uh, how are we really going to do that in practice, the key is to move up by orders of magnitude from 1 to 10 up to the hundreds or thousands of uses per airframe. That is what allows you to divide that, that big manufacturing cost by, by a large number and get to a place uh, where we can really use it for a large number of, of, of uses. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, a lot of words on this slide. Uh, the, the team put these together for me, uh, so there, there's a lot of words. But um, really, what we've tried to do is design Spaceship Two from the start uh, for high cycle life. So we use, um, we try to use aircraft-like um, uh, uh, design approaches where we can. Uh, and that means that where we can, we're modeling uh, requirements based around established FAR or DOD 
um, points. We don't have to use those, but we think that those are, are well established and, and, uh, and particularly when, when they're, they seem appropriate to our systems. Um, they're designed and analyzed for lengthy service lives, uh, statistically designed limit loads and flight test correlation, um, designed for maintainability and uh, ongoing, ongoing uh, use. Um, and where, where necessary or where, where useful, we use COTS uh, components, air data systems, flight deck components, uh, certain valves and consumables. Um, but the, the main thing is that we're, we're thinking constantly about how do we achieve something that can fly thousands of times. Um, uh, so we also try to use reusable systems that enable space flight, so uh, TPS that uh, we don't have to service in between flights, um, reusable oxidizer hardware, that really means the main tank and the pressure and systems related to that. Um, hybrid fuel systems, obviously we dispose of the cartridge after each um, flight, but um, uh, you know, systems that enable rapid refueling and, a, and an aircraft style landing gear system. Uh, of course, the White Knight is essentially an airplane, um, so it's operated like an airplane and, and we use standard uh, approaches to maintenance and, and the ground ops. Um, so let's now decompose that a little bit as we go down through uh, the system. So uh, on the airframe durability, we're using material and joint durability testing of up to a million cycles per individual specimen. Um, you know, when you start to look at the safety factors associated with some of this um, uh, piece part or, or, or uh, individual testing, you have to get really big numbers of, of sample lives. So we have our own NDT, uh, sorry, uh, our own M&P uh, material um, lab to, to do that. Uh, tolerance cycle testing and uh, extensive use of ultrasonic NDT. Our, our, our airframes are all composite, and so, um, so uh, we really need to do a good job uh, as we prepare to monitor the structural, t the health of these vehicles over time. Um, and there's a lot of really great new technology out there, a lot of it driven by the 787 and 350 programs, where uh, Airbus 350 programs, where, where um, new technologies are coming on the market in order to um, help uh, analyze the, the health um, of composite structures over high cycles. Um, so uh, airframe durability, so we're doing uh, cyclic, testic, uh, cyclic testing of full-scale uh, critical structures. So what does that mean in English? Uh, we took our, we took a mock-up, um, but a, a real mock-up, like an, a, a flight, um, a cabin. We took a cabin and we um, put it in a tank and we ran it through 10,000 cycles. Um, and so, you know, with a factor of four, you're talking about um, you know, something that could go for 2,500 cy cycles. Now, we're actually continuing the, 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 the cycle testing of that, but that was enough to sort of give us comfort that this was something that we could get started with. So you're talking about an airframe that in theory, or at least a cabin that could operate for uh, more than 2,000 cycles, um, and that's, uh, and, and probably more. It did well through that, and, and as we're doing that cyclic testing, we're also doing uh, loads on the, on, the, uh, on the vehicle so that we're imposing flight loads during the cyclic testing, and that's sort of what you need to do in order to uh, achieve those higher uh, confidence levels. Uh, and then, of course, we do post-test post destructive inspection. Um, in terms of critical components, sort of the same story. Uh, so for us, the critical components and things like the feather actuators, other, other things related to that, so we'll do uh, large numbers of actuation cycles and under um, uh, worse than real um, uh, flight uh, testing conditions. So. Um, you know, whether it's cold, vibration, moisture, uh, inserting intentional defects uh, or other things. Um, and then qual testing of critical components, um, same story, so we're using uh, different things, heating, uh, vibe, vibe, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the final note that I have on this is crude flight test uh, over the entire operating envelope, so progressive test of the vehicle operation envelopes uh, for speed, altitude, weight, and flight condition. Uh, full and repeated demonstration of manned spaceflight or crewed uh, spaceflight capability during flight test phase. And, and the, the main point is that it's built for reliability and maintainability. And that's really hard in the context of a space system. You know, we're putting fairly large loads on the vehicle uh, for each spaceflight, and we're going to have to do a lot of inspection, uh, particularly in the early years as we look, look at this vehicle and understand how it's doing. Um, but what we're trying to do is to set up a design uh, that, that has the ability to reach for those um, cycle life uh, goals. Um, we also have, in terms of operability, sort of an aircraft-like um, or an airline-like uh, uh, system. So we're using a crew and a crew chief 
um, for each vehicle, for each vehicle, so the carrier aircraft and the spaceship. And what we think that that imparts is, you know, specialized knowledge of that vehicle um, helps support long service life. Um, uh, I think that's basically it. So um, just a final note on philosophy. Um, you know, we are at a tipping point for human space flight, and um, it's an exciting moment, right? Uh, we've been at, we feel like we've been at this tipping point for a few years, but I believe that that is, that is authentically true now. And so the idea that um, we can go from uh, a time in which on average 10 people uh, or 10 new people go to space a year to a time when uh, 100 new people can go to space a year or 1,000 new people can go to space a year or 10,000 or someday 100,000, um, that's going to be a remarkable time that we all go through together. It will be centered, or at least uh, play, uh, the New Mexico will play a huge role in that. And I think, uh, again, I thank the community for uh, supporting Spaceport America and, and what, uh, what we're trying to do down here, because I think it really will be uh, historic. As that uh, space perspective comes out and is shared with people around the world, I think that space perspective is something that is going to be um, very important to solving the world's biggest challenges. And uh, um, certainly, you know, uh, um, uh, that is needed today. So uh, thanks very much for your time. George, thank you. We just have a few questions from the audience. OK. We've got a couple minutes here, if we can. Yep. Um, in the number one question uh, that everybody's interested in, you might have expected this question. Mm -hmm. Sir Richard said, uh, said earlier this week, 3G will be ready to fly people in space in weeks, not months. So can you tell us how many weeks? <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you know, Wayne, I don't, I don't really comment on specific schedule before we, uh, before we get into it. I think the, um, I let uh, Richard uh, um, uh, be the public spokesman for the, for the company on that. I will say, you know, we're entering into, um, you know, the next phase of our test flight pro program. I, I try not to fo be focused on specific uh, flights, but the next phase of flight uh, will entail uh, longer burns and, and higher duration. That's exciting for the team. Um, we are pursuing an incremental test flight program, so you know it's it's always possible that we have uh, uh, you know some reason why we want to um, uh, meet a particular test objective objective or whatever. Um, so you know not not every flight will be high. Uh, you know we'll we'll do a variety of different things as we expand uh, the envelope and try to understand abort scenarios and and other things. We really need to fully expand the envelope of the vehicle. And that doesn't just mean the, the flight trajectory part, but it also means the, the inside. And so that'll be a really important thing. We have a lot of work still to go, um, but we're making good progress. Outstanding. Um, you, we showed pictures of building more Spaceship Two. So how what's the projected size of the fleet that you're gonna build? Well, we'll see. I mean, to a certain extent, it'll be dependent on market demand. Um, you know, uh, we're building the next two vehicles now, and that's, uh, that's exciting for us. I mean, even just, uh, you know, I, for the aviation buffs out there, I mean, I, I, I always got really excited um, to see those old pictures of, like, the, the SR-71 fleet, you know, where you have all these vehicles lined up in a row. Um, you know, I think it'll be exciting for us and other companies as, as, the, as we all build out our fleets and have multiple copies of these things. Um, so, so we'll see, but um, you know, uh, uh, t time will tell. Any more white night to uh, white night sun horizon? Yeah, I mean, we're not build. We're 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 doing the preparatory engineering work on another white night right now. Right now, our, our main manufacturing is focused on the next two spaceships, but we're trying to get the uh, the engineering right uh, for the next white night. We're gonna you know tweak it and improve it in a few ways, and and uh, uh, but that'll be an exciting project for the team. Very good. As uh, the spaceship company that builds the vehicles for you, are they looking at incorporating 3D printing, additive manufacturing in their flight systems? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody's using 3D printing in various ways. Um, uh, we actually use 3D printing more uh, for uh, Launcher One. Uh, Virgin Orbit is doing some incredible work in 3D printing. I think world leading uh, in, in terms of how it's using uh, 3D printing for uh, rocket engines. I think everybody in the rocket business, um, uh, particularly the, the liquid engine side, is uh, using 3D techniques um, but just because the, the lead times for, for plating um, is just so long. So, um, so there's some exciting stuff going on there. But we use it as well on the spaceship side uh, for, for various things. OK. Uh, everybody seems to be very excited about the announcement about a year ago that Saudi Arabia, I think it was Saudi Arabia, was going to invest a billion dollars in, in uh, Virgin Galactic. Um, how is, is that all complete? Is that, uh, 
money in the bank and have you incorporated that in the program? Yeah, well, we we uh, we uh, we were excited about that announcement as well, and and uh, you know we'll have more to say on that when we're when we're ready to do so. Okay. <laughs> I you you've learned well. Yes. Let's see. Have you quantified the costs and duration of the turnaround between flights? Have we quantified the cost and duration of the turnaround yeah. between flights? Yeah. I mean, we have an idea of it. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things that I try to communicate is that we're not going to start out at a flight cadence uh, at the same flight cadence that we hope to have in say year five or something like that, right? We're gonna start out uh, on a slower cadence to make sure that we're taking our time to understand how the vehicle is reacting to the loads, you know, particularly the stuff that I was talking about there. Um, and then over time, I think, you know, once we get through those first few months, we'll be able to start increasing the pace and that'll be a very exciting thing. You know, our, our goal is to have a f high flight rate. One of the things that I haven't talked about in this talk but I've talked about in other talks, is that we are designing it as well to, to have a high flight rate. We can now um, mate the vehicle with the carrier aircraft in about an hour, um, uh, put in the motor uh, or the cartridge in, in, uh, in a few hours. So we're trying to drive down all of those, uh, all of those the, the, the times of each of those um, key processes before flight uh, as low as we can drive it. And you know, this will be an iterative process. We'll learn more as time goes on and, and hopefully be able to improve those times as time goes on. I have to tell you, this must be very popular because the questions are just rolling in here. Mm -hmm. So you're a very popular guy on a very popular mm -hmm. topic, I gotta tell you that. Mm -hmm. Do you have any plans to go farther into space, to take Spaceship Two, maybe to the next level orbital or anything like that? Well, I think we are interested in, in orbital. Um, spaceship Two is not um, an orbital capable, capable vehicle, um, but, uh, but uh, certainly Richard has, uh, uh, a strong interest in, in, in orbital. Um, interestingly, you know, if you talk about point to point, which has always been a driving interest for Richard, high speed point to point, you get close to, if you're doing a rocket based solution, you get close to uh, velocities that are, you know, up towards vo orbital velocities. I, I think that we'll be spending a lot of effort um, after we've uh, initiated the initial fleet in, uh, in the next phase of, of longer, duration, longer burn um, uh, missions that can go higher speeds. And, and hopefully we can integrate some of the technologies that we um, are developing for Spaceship Two into those vehicles. Super. A um, couple of technical questions. Uh, one person asked, how long do you expect the zero-g portion of the flight and what's the planned altitude of the flights? Well, uh, you know, we're, we're going, uh, you know, to be around uh, four minutes order of magnitude. You know, it's just basic physics. Uh, if you go too high, you, you get um, G loads that are pretty high for folks. And so we're trying to balance um, uh, those things, you know, in the U.S., uh, you get your wings over 50 miles. We'll we'll do that, and we'll we'll uh, we'll keep going higher as we as time goes on. Okay. Uh, of local interest, we've had several people several people ask, when are you going to start moving to New Mexico, and how many people do you plan to have here on a on a regular basis? Um, you know, I personally think that we'll have a couple hundred people here um, eventually. Right now we have about 40 people in state, 45 uh, order of magnitude, uh, based in two different locations. We have a, a sort of an office and then we have a um, sort of a, um, a place for warehouse stuff uh, down in the city of Las Cruces. Um, you know, we will, uh, once we get to a certain point in, in the test flight program, we'll be bringing more uh, people over from California. We'll also be hiring people in state and, and uh, from other places. Uh, to round out our, our team. But I think, you know, you're looking at the start somewhere between 100 and 200 people. And any idea on when? Uh, soon, yeah. Soon, okay. <laughs> Weeks, maybe, right? <laughs> okay, we'll so, um, Sir Branson, and I guess I, guess I was fortunate and, and pleased to get invited to the rollout of VSS Unity, and, and uh, Dr. Hawking was a speaker at that. Is, uh, is Sir Branson still open to accommodating people confined to wheelchairs if medically and operationally safe? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, absolutely is the answer. Um, you know, it'll, it'll come down to an individual evaluation basis. Um, we'll need to make sure that we can operate safely, you know. Um, Dr. Hawking flew on the zero-G uh, plane. There was a lot of special preparations that were required in order to do that safely, uh, but they were able to do that, um, thanks in large part to a good partnership with the FAA. Um, I think if we can do that, I've always been really inspired with the idea of uh, flying uh, folks who have various disabilities into space. I think it's gonna be a really exciting thing, um, and uh, we just need to make sure we, have, we can do it safely. 
Very good. A number of people noted that the crew were wearing oxygen masks in the video. Mm -hmm. Are you going to provide oxygen masks for all the flight participants as well? No, the idea is basically that this is a, a shirt sleeve environment. Um, because we're in test flight, we sort of follow test flight procedures with you know the full uh, you know all, all that stuff for our test pilots. But once we, once we get into commercial operations, our aspiration is to is to uh, have a shirt sleeve environment. We will have uh, obviously supplemental ox oxygen in the vehicle. Good. Well, I tell you, there are more questions here, but we are out of time. All right, George. Everybody's interested. Thank you for coming. Thank you for a great presentation. Thank you so much.